Do you remember this video? A tight and fat low end. We all want that, right? Well, here is part two. My last video got a lot of great response and comments and feedback. So I thought I'll make a part two because there's a lot of things to talk about when it comes to low end. And if you haven't watched my first video yet, I really recommend doing that either before or after. You can choose and you'll find a link to it in the description below. So here are three more parts of the equation of getting a tight and fat low end. Number one, face. And this is often forgotten about, but the face relationship between the low end elements of your mix will have a massive impact on the overall fatness of your track. This is especially relevant when you're working with several layers of kick drums. And sometimes you have two kick drums that sound really great on their own, but when added together, the low end seems to almost disappear. And uh, even though they're perfectly aligned on the waveform, this comes down to frequencies canceling each other out. And it's a little bit like having two people who are great on their own, but put them in the same room and they might cancel each other out, you know? And not every sound will work together with another sound. I strongly recommend just checking by ear. And uh, what I do is that I just play one kick drum on its own and I pay attention to the low end. And then I add the other ones on top of it and I listen as I go along. And if at any point the low end seems to disappear or become thin, then I know that that's the problem, right? And then you can either try to phase reverse it or move it left and right a little bit, a few samples. And if none of this works, then sadly, you know that, you know, you might have to change to another kick drum sample. Number two, the way your low end translates to smaller devices is really important and it's just as important as how it sounds on your studio monitors. Well, in my last video, I, I gave you one example where I talked about the uh, expansion and multiband compression trick. But there's another one which I really like too, and that is adding saturation to your bass. And when you add saturation to a sound, and especially low end, it's a little bit like EQing it, but instead of boosting frequencies that are already there, when you're adding saturation, you're actually adding stuff to the frequency content so it's a little bit like adding another layer of clothes on top of the sound, and you're always getting harmonics upwards. There's a lot of plugins on the market and tools that will give you saturation. But one of my favorites is the FabFilter Satin 2. I won't go into depth about this plugin in this video, but I'll definitely do that in the future. Uh, but the thing I wanted to show you today, and, and the thing I love about this plugin, is that it, it allows you to divide the frequency range into bands, so you can pinpoint exactly where you want to put your saturation. And that's really useful. And I personally almost never saturate the subs of a sound, uh, unless I'm going for that super distorted 808 kind of sound on purpose. But in normal cases, if I'm dealing with a bass guitar or kick or something, I like to keep my saturation in the region between 100 and 500 hertz, because that ensures that your low end will stay clean and clear and not so heavy. Three. The way your kick and bass locks together and grooves together is gonna have a massive impact on the, the low end and how your track feels. And this especially applies to songs we're mixing that were performed by, by real musicians. Because if the drummer and the bass player are not really good together, your low end will never sound great because the kick and the bass will not lock together. And sadly, you can apply all these techniques and do everything perfectly you can still not make the track sound great. And that just means that, that we as mix engineers or producers or whatever we are, are never alone. We're always a part of a team or a chain of events. Even though we cannot control this ourselves, there are tricks that we can use when we're mixing to kind of fix or mask bad performances. And here's an example and one trick that has saved me many times. So what you gotta do is putting an expander on the bass, you know, bass guitar or whatever, and then you bring your bass down three or four decibel from where you want it to be in the mix. And then you send the kick drum into the side chain of that expander. So every time the kick appears in the song, the bass gets pushed up to where it should be in the mix. Between the kicks, it goes down three decibel. And uh, this is gonna create an illusion of that the bass guitar is playing with the kick. Does that make sense? And that's gonna make your whole low end feel tighter and cleaner and therefore also fatter. And if you want to check out my exclusive content, uh, take part in live streams and mixing challenges and all that kind of fun, then feel free to check out the link below and it will take you to my Studio Tea Break community. And I'll be back again in a week with another video and next time I'll talk about reverbs. <laughs>